am the bear. I am the biggest of all the animals. I am bear. I am the strongest of all the animals. Yes, I am. I am bear. I am the loudest of all the animals. Yes, I am. I am bear. I am bear. I can do anything. Yes, I can. As soon as Bear said those words, a little voice spoke up from the ground. Can you really do anything? Bear looked down. He saw a little brown squirrel standing on his hind legs. Can you really do anything? Brown squirrel asked again. Bear stood up very tall. I am Bear! I can do anything. Yes, I can. Can you tell the sun not to rise tomorrow morning? I have never tried that before, but I am Bear. I can do that. Yes, I can. No, I can't. Bear turned west to face the sun. It was the time when the sun always goes down. Sun? Bear rose up to his full height and spoke in a loud voice. Sun, do not come up tomorrow. <laughs> At his words, the sun began to disappear behind the hills. You see, Bear said, Sun is afraid of me. He is running away. But will the sun come up tomorrow? No. The sun will not come up. Then Bear turned to face east, the direction where the sun always used to come up. He sat down. Little brown squirrel sat down beside him. All that night they did not sleep. All that night Bear kept saying these words. Now, after I say the words, I'll point to you and you say the words. And then you'll do the same for Brown Squirrel. Yes. The sun will not come up. Hoof. 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 But as the night went on, Little Brown Squirrel began to say something too. He said these words. The sun is going to rise. Ooh. 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 All through the night they sat there. One by one, other animals gathered around them. Listen for your animals. Fox and wolf, hold up your sides. Deer and moose. Rabbit and porcupine. Hawk and owl. Otter and beaver, hold up your mask. Frog and turtle, and even the little mice came. They wanted to see who would be right, bear or ground squirrel. <laughs> this is what the other animals heard. The sun will not come up. Hoof. The sun is going to rise. Ooh. The sun will not come up. Ooh, the sun is going to rise. Ooh. Finally, it was just before dawn, the time when the sun always used to come up. <laughs> turtle, hold up your sign. There is a turtle. Look, said Turtle. A little bit of bread is starting to show. Yes, Al. If you have an owl, hold it up. Yes, said Al. Yes, said Al. A little bit of red is starting to show. Hello, hello. I lost my voice. Oh, another character. Oh, yes. They're only chanting louder. The sun will not come up. Hump. The sun will not come up. Hump. But right next to him, Little Brown Squirrel piped up. The sun is going to rise. Ooh. The sun is going to rise. Ooh. <laughs> <coughs> and the sun came up. The birds.
birds sang their welcoming song. The bright light of the new day spread over the land. Everyone was happy except for one animal. Who do you think that was? Bear. That animal was Bear. He sat there with his head down and a grumpy look on his face. The happiest animal of all was who? Squirrel. Little brown squirrel. The sun came up. The sun came up. The sun came up. The sun came up. <laughs> brown squirrel was so happy he forgot what his wise old grandmother had told him. Listen, because this is a lesson when he was very young. Brown squirrel, his grandmother had said. It is good to be right about something. But when someone else is wrong, it is not a good idea to tease him. Now Little Brown Squirrel began to tease Bear. Bear is foolish, the sun came up. Bear is silly, the sun came up. Bear is stupid, the sun. What? Bear's big paw came down on Little Brown Squirrel, pinning him to the ground. Bear leaned over and opened his huge mouth. Yes, Bear growled. The sun did came up. Yes. I do look foolish, but you will not live to see another sunset. You will not ever tease anyone again because I, Bear, am going to eat you. Brown Squirrel thought fast. You were right to eat me. I was wrong to tease you. I would like to say I'm sorry before you eat me, but you are pressing down on me so hard that I cannot say anything. I cannot say anything at all. I cannot even breathe. If you would lift up your core just a little bit, then I could take a deep breath and apologize before you eat me. That is a good idea. I would like to hear you apologize before I eat you. So Bear lifted up his paw. But instead of apologizing, Brown Squirrel ran. He ran as fast as he could toward the pile of stones where he had his home. He had a tunnel under those stones and a nice warm burrow deep underground. Little Brown Squirrel's grandmother stood there in the door waiting for him. Hurry, Brown Squirrel, she called. Hurry, hurry. Little brown squirrel dove through the door next to his home. But Bear was faster than he looked. He grabbed for a brown squirrel with his big paw. Bear's big, long, sharp claws scratched brown squirrel from the top of his head to the tip of his tail. To the tip. <laughs> Start out differently 
in different countries too. So in the fairy tales that we read, like the three little pigs or Little Red Riding Hood, who knows how those fairy tales start? How do we normally start those types of stories? Yeah, okay, I'll pick someone else. In the beginning. How do those stories start? Once upon a time. So in some stories, you'll read once upon a time, and you'll know right away. Oh, it's a fairy tale. And in other countries, they start a different way. So in Korea, they start out like this. Long, long ago, when tigers still tigers? smoked pipes. So imagine that. Close your eyes and imagine a tiger. Tiger with a pipe like Santa Claus. Long, long ago, when tigers still smoked pipes. So that's a really long time ago, right? I did. That wasn't even a time. Now, when you listen to this story, I want to see if you can figure out what the moral is. Why do you think mommies tell this story to their children? Okay? So that's what I'm going to ask you at the end of the story. Long, long ago, when tigers still smoked pipes, two green frogs lived with their mother in a lotus pond. The green frogs loved their mother, but they never obeyed her and always did the opposite of what she told them to do. When spring arrived at the pond, mother frog woke her son. Rise and shine! Spring is here! She said. They grumpily pulled their blankets over their heads and wiggled their toes. I know how to get them up, Mother Frog thought. She went to the kitchen and cooked a pot of duckweed soup, her son's favorite breakfast. Sure enough, the green frog smelled the delicious soup, and in three jumps, they were in the kitchen. They sat down and eat, they said, she said. Instead, the green frog giggled and hopped around with their spoons. Well then, don't it, said Mother Frog. Right away, the green frog squatted down and gobbled up their soup. It was a messy breakfast. Mother gave Mother Frog a candy to each of her sons, a wet cloth and a broom. Now, let's clean up, she said. But the green frogs tied the wet cloth around their heads and jumped up and down on the screen, leaving footprints all over the kitchen. When Mother Frog finished the cleaning up after her sons, she was tired. All she wanted to do was sit in the tall grass and read a book. The green frogs were hopping around chasing flies. Please be quiet so I can read, she said. Right away, the green frogs began to croak loudly.
Please bury me in the shade by the stream. <laughs> After the mother frog died, the sons were very, very sorry. They had never listened to her. They decided to, be, uh, to obey her this one last time. The green frogs buried her by the stream. That night, it began to rain. It rained for many days and nights, and the stream overflowed its banks. The green frogs began to worry that their mother's grave would wash away. They went to the stream and cried, Rose the best. 
because she was unlike because they were alike as two peas in a pod. Both bad tempered, sharp tongued, and always putting on airs. The mother made Blanche do all the work around the place. She had to iron the clothes each morning. She had to chop the cotton in the afternoon and string beans for supper. While she'd be doing these chores, her mom and sister would sit side by side in rocking chairs on the shady porch, fanning themselves and talking foolishness about getting rich and moving to the city. One hot day, the mother sent Blanche to the well to fetch a bucket of water. When the girl got there, she found an old woman wrapped in a raggedy black shawl, near fanning with the heat, near fainting with the heat. Please, child, give me a sip of water, the old woman said. I'm about to die of thirst. Yes, Auntie, said Blanche, rinsing out her bucket and dipping up some clean, cool well water. Drink what you need. Thank you, child, said the old woman, when she had taken swallow after swallow of water. You got a do-right spirit in your soul. Then she walked away down the path that led to the deep woods. When Blanche got back to the cabin, her mother and sister hollered at her for taking so long. This water's so warm it's near boiling, shouted Rose as she dumped the bucket out on the porch. Here your poor sister near dying for a drop of cool water, her mother screamed, and you can't even bring her that little thing. Then the two of them scolded and hit Blanche until the frightened girl ran into the woods. She began to cry since she didn't have anywhere to go and was scared to go home. <laughs> Suddenly, around the bend in the path came the old woman in the raggedy black shawl. When she saw Blanche, she said kindly, What made you cry so, you poor child? Mama and sister Rose lit into me for something that wasn't my fault, said Blanche, rubbing tears off her cheek. Now I'm afraid to go home. Hush, child, stop your crying. You come on home with me. I'll give you supper and a clean bed. But you got to promise not to laugh at what you see. Blanche gave her word of honor that she wouldn't laugh. Then the old woman took her by the hand and led her deep into the backwoods. As they walked along the narrow path of bushes and tree branches, the bushes and tree branches opened wide in front of them and closed up behind them. Soon they came to the old woman's tumble down shack. A cow with two heads and horns like corkscrews peered over her fist and Blanche and brayed like a mule. She reckoned it was a pretty strange sight, but she didn't say anything, not wanting to hurt the woman's feelings. Next, she saw the yard in front of the cabin was filled with chickens of every color. Some were hopping about on one leg, some running about on three or four or even more. These chickens didn't cluck, but whistled like mockingbirds. But strange as all this was, Blanche stuck by her promise not to laugh. When they got inside the cabin, the old woman said, Light the fire, child, and cook us some supper. So Blanche fetched the wood, fetched the kindling from the wood pile outside the back door. The old woman sat down near the fireplace and took off her head. She sat it on her knees like a pumpkin. First she combed out her gray hair, then she made two long braids. Blanche got pretty scared at this, but the woman had been nothing but kind to her, so she just went on lighting the fire. After a bit, the old woman put her head back on her shoulders and looked at herself in the mirror. Mm-hmm, she nodded, that's better. Then she gave Blanche an old beef bone and said, put this in the pot for supper. Now Blanche was near starving and the bone looked like a pretty sad meal for the two of them. But she did what the old woman said. Shall I boil it for soup, auntie, she asked. Look at the pot, child, the old woman said laughing. 
The pot was filled with thick stew bubbling away. Next, the woman gave Blanche only one grain of rice and told her to grind it in the stone mortar. Feeling mighty foolish, Blanche did as she was told. In a moment, the mortar was overflowing with rice. When they had finished supper, the old woman said, It's a fine moonshiny night, child. Come with me. They sat themselves down on the back porch steps. After a time, dozens of rabbits came out of the underbrush and formed a circle in the yard. The men rabbits had all frock tail coats and the lady rabbits had train trail dresses. They danced standing on their hind feet, hopping about. One big rabbit played a banjo and the old woman hummed to it. Blanche kept time by clapping along. The rabbits did a square dance, a Virginia reel, and a cakewalk. The girl felt so happy she never wanted to leave. She sat and clapped until she fell asleep. And the old woman carried her inside and put her to bed. When Blanche got up the next morning, the old woman told her, Go milk my cow. The girl did what she was told, and the two-headed two cow with the curly horns gave her a bucket with the sweetest cheap milk she ever tasted. They had it with their morning coffee. You got to go home now, child, the old woman said to Blanche, who was washing the breakfast dishes. But I tell you, things will be better from here out. And since you are such a good girl, I got a present for you. Go to the chicken house. Any eggs that say, take me, go ahead and take. But if you hear any say, don't take me, you leave them be. When, the, when you get near home, throw these eggs one after another over your left shoulder so they break into the road behind you. Then you'll get a surprise. When Brent Blanche got to the little chicken house, she found all the nests filled with eggs. Half were gold, half were silver, or covered with jewels. The other half looked no better than the chickens that she got back home. All the plain eggs told her, take me. All the fancy ones cried, don't take me. She wished she could take one gold or silver or jeweled eggs, but she did what the old woman had asked and scooped up the plain ones. She and the old woman waved goodbye to each other. Then Blanche went on her way. Partway home, she began to toss the eggs one after another over her left shoulder. All sorts of wonderful things spilled out of those eggs. Those eggs were now diamonds and rubies and gold and silver coins, pretty silk dresses, and dainty satin shoes. There was even a handsome carriage that grew in a week from the size of a matchbox, and fine and a fine brown and white pony that sprouted from the size of a cricket to draw it. Blanche loaded all of these lovely things into the carriage and rode the rest of the way home like a grand lady. When she got back to the cabin, her mother and sister just gawked at her new finery. Where did you get all of these things, her mother asked, making Rose help Blanche carry the treasures inside. That evening, mother cooked dinner for the first time since Blanche was old enough to hold a skillet all the time telling Blanche what a sweet daughter she was. Her mama got the girl to tell her about the old woman and the cabin and the talking eggs. When Blanche was asleep, the mother grabbed Rose and told her, you gotta go into the woods tomorrow morning and find that old auntie. Then you'll get some of those talking eggs for yourself so you can have fine dresses and jewels like your sister. When you get back, I'll chase Blanche off and keep her things for myself. Then we'll go to the city and be fine ladies like we were meant to be. Can't we just run her off tonight so I don't have to go poking through the woods looking for some crazy old Auntie Rose wine? There's not nearly enough for two, her mother said, getting angry. You do as I say and don't be contrary. 
So the next day, Rose set out dragging foot into the woods. She dwaddled mostly, but soon met the old woman in her raggedy black shawl. My sweet little sister Blanche told me you got a pretty house and all, and I appreciate to see it. You can come with me if you mind to, said the old woman, but you have to promise not to laugh at what you see. I swear, said Rose. So the old woman led her through the bushes and the tree branches into the deep woods. But when they got near the cabin and Rose saw the two-headed cow that brayed like a mule and the funny-looking chickens that sang like mockingbirds, she yelled, if there was ever a sight, that's one. That's the stupidest thing in the world. Then she laughed what? and laughed and laughed until she wow. fell wow. down. And she was asked to start the fire, and she wound up with more smoke than flame. When the old woman gave her an old bone, she put it in the pot for supper. Rose said crossly, that's going to make a mighty poor meal. She dropped it into the pot, but the old bone remained a bone. So they only had thin soup for supper. When the old woman gave her one grain of rice to grind in the mortar, Rose said, that sad speck wouldn't hardly feed a fly. So they had no rice at all. Rose went to bed hungry. <coughs> all night she heard mice scratching under the floor and screech owls clawing at the windows. In the, in the morning, the old woman told her to milk the cow. Rose did, but she made fun of the two-headed creature. And all she got was sour milk, not fit for drinking. So they had their breakfast coffee without cream. When the old woman lifted her head off her shoulders to brush her hair, quick as a wink, Rose grabbed her, grabbed her head and said, I'm not going to put you back together till you give me presents like my sister got. <laughs> oh, child, you are a wicked girl, said the old woman's head. But I got to have my body back, so I'll tell you what you want to know. Go to the chicken house and take those eggs that say, take me, but leave the ones that cry, don't take me. Then you toss those eggs over your right shoulder when you are on your way home. To be sure the old woman wasn't playing her a trick, Rose set the old woman's head out on the porch while her body sat groping around the cabin. Then she ran to the chicken house. Inside the plain eggs cried, take me while the gold and silver and jeweled one said, don't take me. You think I'm fool enough to listen to you and pass up on the prettiest ones? Not on your life. So she grabbed all of the gold and silver and jeweled eggs that kept yelling, don't take me, and off she went into the woods with them. As soon as she was out of sight of the old woman's cabin, she tossed the eggs over her right shoulder as fast as she could. But out of the shells came clouds of whip snakes, toads, frogs, yellow jackets, and a big old gray wolf. These things began to chase after her like pigs after a pumpkin. Hollering, Rose ran all the way up to her mother's cabin. When the woman saw the swarm of things chasing her daughter, she tried to rescue her with a broom. But the wasp and wolf and all the old other creatures wouldn't be chased off. So mother and daughter hot-tailed it into the woods with all the animals following. When they returned home, angry and sore and stung and covered with mud, they found Blanche had gone to the city to live like a grand lady though she remained as kind and generous as always. For the rest of their lives, Rose and her mother tried to find the strange old woman's cabin and the talking eggs, but they never found the place again. I welcome you to this year's reading night. We're so excited to have you here. So, 
Without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to the reader this night, which is Miss Natasha. Say hi to Miss Natasha. Hi, Miss Natasha. And we actually had a little problem this evening, but Miss Natasha stepped in. She brought her beautiful daughter, so we're so excited. Let's give them a hand right off from the back. They say in Hollywood, the show must, must go, go on. on. <laughs> so, listen, boys and girls. So this year we're doing myths and we're doing fairy tales and we're doing um, that genre. And this particular one is a tale from Africa, the motherland. And the name of the story that we will be portraying and Miss Natasha will be reading is Mufara's Beautiful Daughters. But what I want you to notice is that. I'm going to give you a little hint. Are you ready? It doesn't matter what you look like on the outside. You could be the most beautiful person in the world. What matters is how you are on the inside. So with that in mind, without any further ado, I present to you Mufaro's beautiful daughters. But before I do, Mappy, you're going to film? Yes. Because I usually give a parent to do it, but thank you. Okay, I present to you. Mufaro's beautiful daughters. A long time ago, in a certain place in Africa, a small village lay across a river and half a day's journey from a city where a great king lived. A man named Mufaro lived in this village with his two daughters, who were called Manyara and Niasha. Everyone agreed that Manyara and Niasha were very beautiful. Manyara was almost always in a bad temper. She teased her sister whenever their father's back was turned. And she had been heard to say, Someday, Niasha, I will be a queen. Someday, Niasha, I will be the queen. And you will be a servant in my household. And you? <laughs> you will be a servant in my household. Well, if that should ever happen, I will be happy to serve you, my dear sister. And Niasha also said, But well, why do you say such things? You are clever and strong and beautiful. Why are you so unhappy? Well, first of all, why are you so sweet? All the time. <laughs> and I do believe that father loves you best. <sighs> and Manyara also said, but when I am a queen, everyone will know that your silly kindness is only a weakness. But when I am queen, everyone will know, you, 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 that your silly kindness is only a weakness. Mm -hmm. Niara was sad that Manara felt this way, but she ignored her sister's words and went about her chores. Niasha kept a small plot of land on which she grew millet, sunflowers, carrots, and vegetables. She always sang as she worked, and some said that her singing made her crops more bountiful than anyone else's. One day, Niasha noticed a small garden snake resting beneath a carrot vine. Good day, little Nioka. Good day, little Nioka. You are welcome here. You are welcome here, my garden. You will keep away any creatures who might spoil my vegetables. You will keep away any creatures who might spoil the vegetables. She gave the little snake a loving pat on the head and returned to her work. From that day on, Nioka was always at Niasha's side when she tended her garden. It was said that she sang all the more sweetly when he was there. Mufaro knew nothing of how Manyara treated Niasha. Niasha was too considerate of her father's feelings to complain, and Manyara was always careful to behave herself when Mufaro was around. Early one morning, a messenger from the city arrived. Oh my gosh! The king needs a queen. All the beautiful maidens must go. The king needs a queen. Mufaro called Manyara and Niasha to him. Manyara, Niasha, please come. It would be a great honor to have one of you chosen. Prepare yourselves to journey to the city. I will call together all our friends to make a wedding party. We will leave tomorrow as the sun rises. 
Tomorrow. Did you say tomorrow, tomorrow Father? Yes. Well. So exciting. No, 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 no. Wait, hold up, hold up. Dad, um, do you think, I don't think that um, my sister would really like to leave you. I think you should only send me. Only send me. The king has asked for the most worthy and the most beautiful. That would be me. No, Lanyara. I cannot send you alone. Only a king can choose between two such worthy daughters. Both of you must go. That night, when everyone was asleep, Manyara stole quietly out of the village. She had never been in the forest at night before, and she was frightened. But her greed to be the first to appear before the king drove her on. In her hurry, she almost stumbled over a small boy who appeared standing in the path. Please, said the little boy, I am hungry. Will you give me something to eat? Give you? Seriously? <laughs> give you something to eat? I don't think so. <laughs> After traveling through what seemed to be a great distance, Manara came to a small clearing. There, silhouetted against the moonlight, was an old woman seated on a large stone. The old woman spoke. I will give you some advice, Manyara. Soon after you pass the place where two paths cross, you will see a grove of trees. They will laugh at you. You must not return. laugh in return. Later, you will meet a man with his head under his arm. You must be polite to him. First of all, how do you know my name? Secondly, you need to address me as your queen. Because tomorrow I shall be your queen. And thirdly, don't laugh. Are you serious? <laughs> I laugh at danger. Like, please, old ugly woman. <laughs> Just as the old woman had foretold, Manyara came to a grove of trees, and they did seem to be laughing at her. I must be calm, Manyara thought. I will not be frightened. She looked up at the trees and laughed out loud. <laughs> and she hurried on. It was not yet dawn when Manyara heard the sound of rushing water. The river must be up ahead, she thought. The great city is just on the other side. But there, on the ride, she saw a man with his head tucked under his arm. A head under an arm? Now this dude has serious problems. <laughs> and she hurried on towards the city. Niasha woke at the first light of dawn. As she put on her finest garments, she thought about how her life might be changed forever beyond this day. I'd much prefer to live here, she admitted. Wow. I'd, hate to leave, I'd hate to leave this village and never see my father. I'd leave this village and never see my father again. Or sing to little Nioka again. Her thoughts were interrupted by loud shouts and a commotion from the wedding party assembled outside. Manyara was missing. Manyara! When they found Manyara's what, what? On the path that led to the city, they decided to go on as planned. As the wedding party moved through the forest, brightly plumped birds darted about in the cool green shadows beneath the trees. Though anxious about her sister, Niyasha was soon filled with excitement about all there was to see. They were deep in the forest when she saw the small boy standing by the side of the path. You must be hungry. You must be awfully hungry. And she handed him a carrot she had brought for her lunch. For you. The boy smiled and disappeared as quietly as he had come. Later, as they were approaching the place where the two paths crossed, the old woman appeared and silently pointed the way to the city. Niasha thanked her and Thank gave you. her a small pouch filled with sunflowers. Thank you ever so much. So kind of you. 
The sun was high in the sky when the party came to the grove of towering trees. Their uppermost branches seemed to bow down to Miyasha as she passed beneath them. At last, someone announced that they were near their destination. Miyasha ran ahead and topped the rise before the others could catch up to her. She stood transfixed at the first sight of the city. Oh, my father. Oh, my father. A great spirit must stand guard here. A great spirit must stand guard here. I never in all my life dreamed there could be anything so beautiful. I never dreamed of seeing anything this beautiful. Miyasha and her father descended the hill, crossed the river, and approached the city gate. Just as they entered through the great doors, the air was rent with piercing cries, and Manyara ran wildly out the <laughs> Because I have been all of these, I know you to be the most worthy and the most beautiful daughter in the land. It would make me very happy if you would be my wife. And so it was that, a long time ago, Niasha agreed to be married. The king's mothers and sisters took Niasha to their house, and the wedding preparations began. The best weavers in the land laid out their finest cloth for her wedding garments. Villagers from all around were invited to the celebration, and a great feast was held. Niasha prepared the bread for the wedding feast for Millet, and that had been brought from her village. Mufara proclaimed to all who would hear him that he was the happiest father in the land, for he was blessed with two beautiful and worthy daughters, Niasha the queen and Manyara, a servant in the queen's household. <laughs> the end.